All right, we are live. So um, today is May 17th, and uh, I'm here with Erica Cavaluzzi, who is a dental hygienist and myofunctional therapist who has uh, graduated from my MyoMentor program. So um, we're talking today because it's Mouth Breathing Awareness Month, and that is something that I started doing to bring awareness to myofunctional symptoms. So there's a huge connection between mouth breathing, myofunctional issues and sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing, which is severely underdiagnosed and underrecognized in healthcare and medicine and dentistry in general. So we're trying to shine some light on that. And I'm asking all of my amazing graduates to share their stories on how they got into this field and how it relates to them personally. So that's why Erica's here today. Um, Erica, you are from Northern Virginia, like the DC area, right? Correct. And let's just get your practice name out there. So that is facial fitness and well-being. And you have practiced myofunctional therapy um, in person and online, right? I mean, if Correct. it wasn't for COVID. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, I'd love for you to share your story and kind of, you know, talk about what we said a little bit before. Uh, and, and then, you know, we'll just talk and, and go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. So yeah, yeah so like Sarah said, I'm Erica and um, I was first started this journey back when she was a dental hygienist probably about four or five years ago. Um, the dentist I had was working for uh, was very into airway dentistry and that kind of really sparked my interest. Um, at the time my husband had just been diagnosed with sleep apnea um, wow. and to me uh, he did not at all fit you know the stereotypical sleep apnea patient at least to what I knew at that time he was you know, young, trim, worked out every day, very lean, muscular, um, but he was diagnosed with sleep apnea and started using a CPAP. And so um, I really wanted to learn, you know, how did, how did we end up here? Yeah. And what can I do for, you know, my patients to kind of avoid this? I had, you know, a very large following with children as a hygienist. And, you know, I just felt like it was my responsibility to kind of get out there and figure out what could we do. So I didn't really I, know that about your husband, um, yeah. so that that was kind of what started everything. I think, uh, you know, it is, it, it is crazy that, healthy young people can get sleep apnea and and that's that's what i'm trying to get out there so i'm really glad that you brought that up yeah and it was just and that was the whole thing so you know how could this be how could he have sleep apnea and and you know how come we didn't know about this and how come nobody ever even suggested he went out on his own and was tested just because he felt like there's got to be something mm. and so i started you know reading every article taking every course doing anything and everything i can do to kind of figure out you know where's my place on this journey to help patients. And that's how I came across myofunctional therapy. And um, at that time I had no idea what it was, <laughs> what it even meant, <laughs> where it fit in, but I just felt like that was my place. And so I decided I was gonna go out and I was gonna pursue this and I wanted to become a myofunctional therapist. And so um, at the same time, here I am as a mom. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter at the time and she had me like at my wits end. We, she had severe anxiety, like, Anxiety I've never seen a five-year-old have. Um, she was extremely sensitive, especially emotional. Um, she was having, you know, horrible stomach aches every single day, bloody noses every day for hours. It would bleed and bleed and bleed, and we couldn't get it to stop. And so I started this whole journey, figuring, trying to figure out an answer. And so I'm going from doctor to doctor to doctor, and like nobody's giving me answers. The pediatrician's like, oh, well, let's test her for celiacs. Let's test her for, you know, lactose intolerance. They sent me to the gastroenterologist. They told me, I, I think it's all in her head. I don't think she, I don't think this is real. And I'm thinking, like, this, this can't that's be, so, this can't that's be so it. That's so discouraging. Yeah, that's like when you're told, like, oh, it's all in your I mean, I feel like this is like the worst thing to tell people is that, oh, you're just imagining it. You're just emotional. Or I mean, that's horrible. <laughs> I mean, she's five years old and, you know, so finally I, I went to the school and I said, hey, you know, any suggestions what I can do, what you can help? And before I knew it, I'm in a, this room of 15 plus school board members and they want to hear her story. And they came back and said, well, it's not affecting her schoolwork. She's a great student. There's nothing we can do to help you pretty much. And I was like, okay. It's like, I didn't know where else to go. And in the midst of this, I'm learning and learning and learning about everything with myofunctional therapy and kind of what does sleep disorder breathing look like and it's like a light bulb and I was like oh my gosh my daughter is is this person and how did I miss this all this time how's there how's nobody else talking about this and so I remember going to 
um, one of my first myofunctional therapy courses with um, a hygienist who had told me that their dentist was starting to work with children in sleep disorder breathing. And so I remember looking her up and calling and setting an appointment, and that was Dr. Tracy Wynn. And um, we went for a consult, awesome. and I said, what do you think? Am I crazy? Do you think she could have myofunctional disorders? You know, is this all interrelated? And she's like, no, you're not crazy. You know, at the time, you know, she had this like perfect class one occlusion of primary teeth, spacing between all of her teeth. Looking at her and smiling, you would, I thought, oh, eventually she looks great, you know? Yeah. So she's like, let's do a take home sleep study test and see what it says. And so that's what we did. And that's where we, we started her journey. And it came back saying, you know, it was alarming, but, you know, the amount of um, times that she stopped breathing. Never snored at night. We never heard her snore. She never did wow. snore. Um, she was definitely more of like a covert, you know, yeah. she's that it's kids like that that really fly under the radar. Like they're not snoring. They have straight teeth. You know, things don't look super out of whack. And so most of us kind of think, you know, it's in your head. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so when we went for this, the sleep study and the sleep study came back and confirmed that she did actually have sleep apnea. Wow. Okay. And, you know, their suggestion was tonsils and adenoids removal, um, flonase and singular. That was their course of treatment. And I remember looking at the doctor and saying, you know, I was thinking about maybe going this path of palatal expansion. And they kind of looked at me like, okay. <laughs> And so off I went, I went to the antique to confirm. I mean, I, I'm a hygienist. I've looked in her mouth millions of times. I knew her tonsils were not enlarged by any means, but I just needed that confirmation. It wasn't her adenoids too. I didn't want to be missing a part of the, the picture. And so the yeah. antique scoped her and the auntie agreed that the adenoids were insignificant. Um, and they kind of left it out there. And I kind of suggested to them too, that, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this whole idea of expansion and myofunctional therapy. And they're kind of oh yeah, I've kind of heard of that um, and kind of set me on my way. And so that's where we started. And one of the first things we did, we, she was in a healthy start appliance. Then we went into actual full expansion. And was this with Dr. Wynn? It wasn't, it was actually with um, another orthodontist in the area. Because um, okay. Dr. Tracy Wynn was a little bit further for us. So we kind of found another like-minded orthodontist a little bit closer to us. Um, that's Dr. Cool. That's awesome. Um, you should give that orthodontist a shout out. Yeah, her name that's... is Dr. Liliana Calkins. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll have to, you know, let people know about all these, you know, yeah. the orthodontists who are trying to do this stuff. So awesome. And she kind of set us on this whole pathway of um, treatment. And so we're, we're in expansion and, and she really focused on the whole concept that um, when Leah was an uh, infant, she was actually born with torticollis. Mm. And she had had her um, phrenectomy, her lingual phrenectomy um, revised when she was two weeks old. Okay. So I always thought, okay, she's good. We don't have to worry about the front end anymore. Um, and lo and behold, she did have a posterior tie still. So that was a big part of this picture of what went wrong um, that we were kind yeah. of all missing. I'm glad um, you're bringing that up because, as you know, a lot of patients who, you know, the, the Freena Mose release when either they personally were babies or when their kids were babies, uh, think that that's all there is to it and, and that it's fine. And, and sometimes for whatever reason, it's not a full release. You know, it just depends on the doctor. And plus, you know, the, the knowledge around this stuff five years ago, seven years ago, I know your daughter's seven now, it was so different than it is today. So um, it's very possible that it could be done as a baby and then still not be completely um, mobile, right? Right, exactly. I mean, when she was done, they pretty much did it and said, okay, now just start feeding her and, and that's all you have to do. I mean, we never did exercises pre or post or anything. So um, it was funny because I'm thinking I had blinders on all this. I knew all this information. I was just not applying it to my own daughter. I was like, oh, I think this is awful. Um, <laughs> so common did. though. <laughs> So yeah, so we went back through, um, she had been in physical therapy from when she was about four weeks old till she was almost one years old from the torticollis. And as I, I actually learned from you, this whole idea of the fascia and how that was, it could be intertwined to the lingual frenum. So we went back to the physical therapist and they kind of just made sure that everything was aligned and her posture was really good. Um, good, wow. Amazing. Yeah, so she's, she's been on this journey. Um, we went back and had her, her tongue released. Um, 
I was an oral surgeon in Maryland, we ended up finding. His name is Dr. Zebowitz. Awesome, we loved him. Um, but yeah, she's, she's, she's been my trooper, but I mean, a, a totally different child. Good, so you, we you have, have how is she oh doing with the anxiety and the digestion? Like, go through all those symptoms you listed before and tell so us she, You know, chronic stomach aches, no longer. Bloody noses, I don't think we've had a bloody nose at all. Um, and at least, you know, eight, you, eight months to a year, at wow. least. I mean, this was getting every single day, having bloody noses. Um, the anxiety, I mean, we still have some days where you can tell she just didn't sleep well that night for whatever reason, and you can tell the anxiety comes back. Um, but nothing like it was. Um, yeah. Nowhere near as sensitive as she was. Um, and I and think it all from, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I think it was all because like her sympathetic nervous system was always on, <laughs> like it never oh, turned, really? never yeah. ever turned off. And so as soon as we can kind of regulate her, everything else just kind of calmed down. For sure. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't make that link between poor sleep and anxiety and that being in that fight or flight mode, which is, it's so, it's so true. And then also um, when people don't sleep well, and especially growing kids, um, they don't have that emotional resilience, you know, like an adults too, um, you're moody, um, you know, anxious, uh, just how, how can you control your your moods and your emotions when you're like exhausted, you know, you're like at the end of your rope, you just don't have that resilience. So um, I I'm glad she's doing better. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a, a great journey and we're thankful. Um, and that's kind of been my thing now is just like, how do I avoid other people from doing, I mean, I, I never knew my daughter wasn't a good sleeper. I mean, she was never a, the perfect sleeper, but I just thought kids don't always sleep well. Um, I never heard her snore. I mean, I never sat by her bedside and watched her um, until I started really kind of opening my eyes and realizing a lot more goes on at, during the night than I really even ever knew was happening. Yeah, um, you know, I'm she really sleep glad. with her mouth open sometimes. Um, I'm glad you're pointing all this stuff out because, um, and this was like Erin talked about in her interview yesterday, like not everything is really obvious and like crazy bad symptoms. Like there's a lot of people who have symptoms, but they're pretty mild seeming and they will fly under the radar. And so it's, it's interesting because in a lot of ways, your daughter looked pretty mild, but in a lot of ways, she was also on that, that more severe end of the spectrum with the breathing and sleep and all that. So it's, it's not one size fits all. That's for sure. And we can't always just look at every person as like, you know, like you said, your husband, uh, <laughs> The old overweight man that's who has sleep apnea not the young fit athletic guy you know and uh the kid with the obvious open mouth and you know dark circles under the eyes those aren't the only kids with the sleep and breathing issues you know sometimes it's the kids with the straight teeth and so we just have to i think really pay attention <laughs> you know it's true it could look so different even from kid to kid i mean that's what really kind of made me think wow like you can't just ask you know does he snore at night is that that's just, it's just not enough. What, um, if you could give other parents advice, what would you say to look for um, when it comes to sleep? If not snoring, because that's, that's one thing for sure. If kids are snoring, it's not normal, but what else would you say that you learned from, from your daughter and this whole experience? Um, so the one thing for sure is kind of, you know, what goes on during the nighttime. So when they fall asleep, do they wake up in the same position? My daughter was like completely on the other side of the bed, blankets off, had to wear like shorts and a tank top to bed because she would overheat at night. I never knew that those were, you know, interrelated. Mm -hmm. I just thought, okay, she's just hot when she sleeps at nighttime. Um, so those are some really big key things that I, nobody ever even asked me. You know, yeah. the, the pediatrician always says, well, do they snore? No, and then, she, okay, then she's fine. Um, yeah, the overheating one is interesting. Um, night sweats is another one. Um, and I think a lot of parents don't, they're, like you said, oh, she just is a hot sleeper, you know? <laughs> Um, bedwetting is more of an obvious, like that's a big red flag one, right. um, but that's not always part of it. I don't know if your daughter had that when she was Yeah, no, there. never. I mean, she yeah. never had an issue with it. Yeah. Great. Well, um, do you want to share about anyone else in your family or do you want to <laughs> talk about your practice? I mean, uh, I um, think it's great. So, yeah. So I have, I mean, it, it's funny because I also have now, have, she's now 18 months old, but I, you know, going through this journey with my older daughter, I feel like I'm even more aware and trying to prevent um, anything with her. But literally from the day I took her home from the hospital, her mouth was open all oh the time. God. And I would constantly 
do this. And my husband, I remember my in-laws, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, her mouth's not supposed to be open. Like, I don't know why it's open, but it's not supposed to be open. Um, and so I've kind of gone through this journey from with her, totally a different experience with her being so young. Um, yeah. She had a lingual frenum that needed to be released. So she did have hers released already. Um, but I already kind of questioned whether or not it really will need to be released again, knowing yeah. kind of what we're still kind of dealing with. Um, but um, the munchie has been an amazing tool for her. She cool. loves her munchie. It? She uses oh, I would it. love to see um, get videos of her doing it. Yeah, I, I will that. definitely share um, <laughs> because that's been kind of a godsend for us in trying to help because, I mean, it's when she, they're that young, there's not much you feel like you can do to help. And I, I yeah. but I know that I need to do something. Um, yeah. no, it was funny. Awesome. I even took her to like the allergy. I mean, I've been everywhere with her too. And the allergy just commented, you know, um, she breathes through her mouth. And I said, yeah, I know. And I'm like, what can I do? And she's like, oh, I don't know, but she breathes through her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> She's not allergic to anything, but I was like, okay. <laughs> That's kind of my mission. I'm all about like getting the word out, trying to find the right providers and getting my patients into the right people's hands because I think that's a big part of it. There's so many providers out there who just who just don't know. They haven't taken the time to kind of educate themselves. And um, I know what it's like to be on this journey and keep getting the same answers and, and you know there's something not right and yeah. you want to do something do the right thing so well I'm so happy that you're here and sharing your story and I think there's a reason that you know we found each other because we're on the same mission here and I love that so I'm super um, thankful that you wanted to come on and share your story I know you even said it's not something you are typically used to talking about and um, you know this is it's it's good it's good to share this stuff because now this is how we reach other people and help other people so that's my whole mission with this thing so um, yeah, I hope people reach out to you. I hope this goes out and, um, you know, get some, some views and some attention and people reach out to uh, you and all those awesome dentists and other people who've supported you along the way. So I'll make sure we link your website. And um, again, you're in the, um, what is it, Northern Virginia, Western, Northern, Northern. Virginia, DC area. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I hope people find you. And again, your practice is facial fitness and well-being, myofunctional therapy. So Thank you, Erica. Any last words or any any last shout outs for anyone? Um, no, I say, say thank you for you for, you know, giving us this opportunity to kind of get our word out too. I mean, it's been an amazing journey and you've been a big part of it. So I really oh, appreciate thank you. That's so sweet. That makes me, <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's awesome. Thank, thank you so much. So um, I'll let you get on with your night, but this was really fun. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking again, but <laughs> <Sounds good. laughs> <All right. laughs> I'll see you later. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>